So Design Fugitives, for um, those of you who haven't heard of us, uh, we're an art studio. We've been around since 2010. Um, there are three business partners, and then we have about, uh, depending on the project load, anywhere from five to eight employees, four of them, which are here on the back there. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of work that we've done is going to be missing from this slideshow because you know we're refining our kind of core competencies and what it is that we really want to do. But uh, we've done anything from coasters that've been sold at the Museum of Modern Art in New York to uh, custom furniture for Coles that we've done recently for their corporate headquarters, um, reclaimed material. Um, we've done um, children museum exhibits. It's just a lot of. Uh, Anything creative and design and cool fabrication will probably be uh, done. But we're, we're slowly and are more actively engaging in art making um, for a variety of reasons, but um, it's just a space where we find we have the most creative uh, space uh, that reflects our design process and our fabrication process. So um, Taylor made is kind of speaks to our collaborative um, methodology that we do with our clients, our partners, uh, and um, the way that we approach every project, um, they all each have uh, their unique sets of parameters. And so that's why we love specificity in each project. That's a great constraint to start. Um, it doesn't let us sort of float in space with our solution. And complexity is where we can give each project its unique identity. And I'll speak to that um, in the following slideshow here. So our first major commission was, um, well, it used to be called Flutter, but we changed the names to Orchid Bloom since at uh, Johnson Controls, uh, their new headquarter building that was built in 2012. Before the new building went up, there was a willow tree on the site that um, a lot of the employee has taken a liking to. I think they take their lunches under the tree. This is not the same tree, by the way. It's been gone. <laughs> uh, but um, when we met with the client rep, uh, you know, uh, the whole team, they kept mentioning this tree. It's like, yeah, we love to bring some aspect of it back to the project. So um, this is sort of uh, a picture of one of the, of the final installation that we did. But uh, from the inspiration of the willow tree, this, is, this was the first initial concept um, to kind of have this draping canopy that was sort of uh, fluid and flowing. Um, those sort of trapezoidal shape uh, are they were conceived of as a um, plastic material that was heat formed that form was uh, inspired by uh, you might have seen this lighting fixture it's called the luce pulp fixture it's actually really popular i think it costs like uh, depending on the size you get it's anywhere from three to eight thousand dollars a piece but uh, what we loved about this was the optics right that um, that Fresnel lens. And uh, based on the slight deformation, you have this sort of optical depth. Uh, and this is a uh, Fresnel lens that is in a lighthouse. So the geometry is simple, right? You just uh, kind of reconfigure the lens so that you decrease the depth and have the same magnification. That's as simple as that. So. But the optical effects, though, are beautiful because they're also found in nature. And this, is, this was like a major sort of uh, bifurcation in the design process where we realized that we can merge the optical effects, which, which is a synthetic mechanical material that can be man-made with forms that are found in nature. So we started to sample wings and flower petals uh, and have a collection of these organic shapes. And the way that we imagine that they would each have their own optical um, characteristic is based on the lens 
and where their placement is relative to the lens, they would have slightly different um, optical qualities. So uh, this is just a lot of process picture. Um, this was an earlier model of how we were going to hang all these pieces. And then it developed into, um, I wrote a script for this. This is a uh, branch growth. So it took a branch and started to kind of bifurcate. And it made a, a, a upside down uh, tree can canopy, basically. But um, even though it's trying to mimic a, a, a tree canopy, it felt kind of mechanical. So we kind of backtracked a little bit, and um, I, I kind of have to step away from all the code, uh, the, the code writing that I, I sometimes do. And we started uh, to uh, actually collaborate with the architect uh, on this project, which was uh, Gensler out of Chicago. And it was a back and forth of actually like six months of design of how to kind of make this thing look organic and feels organic. Um, and what we came up with was a, um, a cluster system. So there's a spine in the middle, and these wings or petals are held onto the spine by a custom piece of hardware. Um, in the picture, you will notice Chad here getting really worried about that hot spot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because because Fresnel lens do have the capability to magnify heat like intensely. Um, same materials is used in your solar heating, and also um, you might have burned some ants as a kid. So it's <laughs> it's uh, it it can. So with that, we had to uh, kind of step back and study the focal point of each of the pieces. So if we map all the lenses that we use onto a stock sheet, each of them will have the same focal point, right? And then we remapped it back onto the cluster to prove to the client that um, through the adjacency of the clusters, nothing is gonna get like double and triple magnified and burn something. So that was like a actual verification that we had to do for ourselves and for the client to kind of uh, put them at ease that nothing will burn, so never thought about that beforehand, right? <laughs> and um, the following slides will kind of speak to that complexity that I mentioned earlier. Um, so in that six month process, um, what came out of it was that we're gonna, we were going to have one system with six variations, right? So the system is rod, hardware, and lenses, but there are six totally different configuration to that same system. Um, and so this is just the different lenses that we use and the different material based on their color. Um, we had to optimize the material, which is Fresnel lens, um, really expensive plastic, somewhat cheap uh, plastic, and then there was one more, um, maybe not identified in here. But we had to kind of mix the ratio of plastic to, br to bring the cost in couldn't find a local manufacturer, local meaning US, that would produce a big enough sheet of Fresnel that would be cost effective. So we had to do it overseas. And um, the shipping cost was almost as much as the material itself. So um, that was an interesting exercise in, uh, in importing for us. <laughs> and so as you can see, um, you know, this is readily available four by eight sheets. But these are the Fresnel lens, which is only a meter by a meter, was the max size that we could find at the time. So um, this was a way for us to kind of optimize the cost, is to split it up and find a, an even mixture. The custom hardware was designed to have three degrees of freedom. Um, you can s so this one here controls the rotation around the rod. This one control a pivot, kind of like your elbow, and then there's another one that twists internally to itself here. So there are those three degrees of freedom. Um, since then, we've learned that that's way too much like rotation. So uh, in the latest project that we're doing in Kuwait, which I'll show you, it has one degree of freedom, which is totally controlled. Um, 
but this is the result. Um, looking from below, there was 29 clusters total, I believe, if I remember correctly. <laughs> and this was on a winter day, by the way. Is that color from the lens? Yeah, so with the mixture of acrylic, um, there is a material that is no longer in production. Um, that is dichro. I don't. I don't think dichroic is the right way to say it, but um, it's kind of prismatic. So it changes its reflection depending on the angle of incident. So that's this is the same material as this, but because of the angle of incident, it looks blue versus purple. So we're. I'll, I'll, I'll get to it in the few slide. But um, if you ever get a chance to see it which is really hard because they are really strict about security clearance. Um, that diagram that I showed earlier about mapping the focal point, you can see that much clearer here based on the reflection of each of the Fresnel lens. They're reflecting different parts of the sculpture around them. Um, and the nuance is really subtle. You, you see little bits of colors, right? Um, when you're there looking at it in person. So it's really hard to capture it with this picture or even this picture look mostly white. But when you're there in person, if you look really closely, you see these little subtle reflection and refraction actually. It's the changes as you move around it? Yeah, exactly, because of those, because of those changing focal points. So. What does it look like at night? Um, it's actually, unfortunately, it's not lit. Right. Yeah. Um, they retroactively put in two um, color kinetics that's just not powerful enough to light it. I've driven it past it at night before to see, but just they don't, they don't, they don't have enough power to light it at night. So, so is, is the section of each piece also contoured? No, it's, this is all flat. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you can see it really here, right? With the light being different than these pieces on the inside. It, it's, uh, it's really intense to, to, to look at it in person. So, I mean, really, uh, you know, uh, upon reflection, uh, it's, maybe it's more appropriate for our climate that it's more like this than the green tree. Um, but since then, we have um, improved the system this was the second installation, albeit much smaller. This is at Sojourner Peace family on the north side, on the, uh, Martin Luther King, I believe. So this was a three cluster installation where we completely used only that, um, that material, that dichroic material, um, and learned some lessons from that. Um, this is the dry fit of a piece that we installed in Hong Kong last July. Um, the reason why I only have the picture of the dry fit is uh, due to uh, some water damage, they still have the piece wrapped up in plastic, so I can't even have final photos of it. <laughs> um, uh, again, this was a three cluster. Um, what's new in this that we haven't tried in, uh, at JCI or at Sojourner is that we started to add um, solid colors, orange, red, and yellow. Um, I think uh, it has something to do with feng shui. You know, China uh, in Hong Kong, um, they needed to have certain colors for the flow of money. Before you go, go on, I mean, it's got an obvious like connection to Calder. Yeah. The sculptor. So, is there have you ever experimented with movement in that? Um, movement was actually a concern for Johnson Control because they didn't want pieces falling on people. It's, it's, it's like a whole other right. Um, so Journer actually moves. Oh, cool. um, let me see if we can. S so it's actually so Journer. Yeah, you can't see. There's there's a circular plate that it's mounted to, and when the a when the HVAC is going, it will start to dance. So yeah, that that is actually a really desired quality if you want it. Right. But at Johnson Control, they just want things fixed. And what's the material in the, the architecture here? Drywall. Reflections. Drywall. That's like a whole other production. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, in Hong Kong, um, 
what was not anticipated was the reflection of the dichroic material on the, on the ceiling. It looks like there was koi swimming in the sky. And they totally love that. <laughs> yes. I was like, yes. Um, so this is uh, coming in June in Kuwait. Um, just the next iteration. Uh, 21 clusters arranged in a spiral. So how did you grow your practice internationally like that? Was it um, this ca this happens through a referral. Uh, actually, tertiarily, three steps from what Jason did, uh, Justin did for us. This is the uh, no. This is not it. Oh, but okay. this is related to what to, uh, to uh, the relationship that you know we started after wow. Justin came to us. So yeah. Um, Keep in touch with your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, this is uh, one of two projects that we will be doing for this, uh, this mall. Um, this is a dining terrace. Um, the, the win for us here was the client said, uh, we have one chihuly in another space, but we would prefer not to put the chihuly here if you can give us something better. Um, same mall. Uh, this is a this is a, in a different court. I think this is their main entry court, and we're um, flushing out the uh, structural and the fabrication of this. Uh, at the at the moment, it's forty feet tall stainless steel ribbon. Kitten Ace, have anybody been to the store in the third world? The light fixture? Yeah. So we, we did that. <coughs> Kitten Ace was kind of an interesting project. Uh, when uh, Jenny, the, the store owner, came to us, you know, like uh, I started to remember, like, as a kid, my mom has a fabric shop, and I used to be the security person sleeping in the attic. I don't know what that would have done, but <laughs> uh, so I, I kind of have this picture in there just to kind of remind me of that. Um, but um, Kit and Ace, uh, their sort of uh, selling point is technical cashmere, um, and uh, I assume most people know cashmere's from uh, <clears throat> from goat. Um, but what was really interesting for us was that. Um, they had no prescription about what the light fixture has to be. And so, uh, you know, uh, that open-ended uh, sort of design criteria was tough. So what I needed to do was kind of research what they do. So I arrived at looking at um, wool and uh, fiber at the microscopic level to see how it works. <coughs> and so the, um, the little scaly um, form gives wool its uh, better quality versus your straight polyester. But the biggest, in the, the biggest inspiration was from uh, the technology of weaving and fabric, right? This is a, a weaving uh, shuttle. Um, and so, you know, it sort of immediately spoke to me that, you know, this is going to be the form because it has kind of like a, an element inside that we can replace to be a light. Um, it has a form that uh, we can make with our CNC process. Um, and so <clears throat> to, uh, to take inspiration from wool, uh, which uh, gets its strength from you know, randomly uh, intertwined uh, fibers, uh, the arrangement for these shuttles was also um, random. And what that, uh, what that give us in terms of quality is that it's a different fixture in the round as you walk around it. It's never the same. Some plywood prototype, we needed to kind of see how bright the LED was. Um, different variation of how to hang them. Different slots. And 
there are three on the CNC router. Um, just a side note, the CNC router, for those of you who have seen it, uh, we built that ourselves when we first started the business. But uh, we are buying a real CNC machine that will be like awesome. So. <laughs> Um, the copper rods uh, to suspend the shuttles, um, one of their branding material is copper. So we use copper rods instead of our normal um, wire rope, stainless, uh, stainless steel wire rope that we <coughs> kind of default to often. Made some, um, couldn't find a good way to run the power down the, uh, the copper, so we had to run actual uh, power cable. And um, we just made these clips in-house to uh, to run the, uh, the wire cables down the copper rods, as you can see. And then they became kind of like a really cool element because they kind of twinkled in, the, in space. So. The wood is white ash that was kind of whitewash with uh, uh, like a custom mix that we had. Um, <coughs> solid. Yeah, it's all milled out solid. Um, what's actually kind of cool, uh, what's interesting about this picture is that platform above. Um, I couldn't find a diagram to put in here, but um, the way that these sit three-dimensionally is dictated by the arrangement of those holes above. Um, so, the, so the goal is that the next piece that we will do using the same elements will change that arrangement and the shuttles will have a different form outcome. So. And also, um, I'm working on trying to run the power down the copper rod, then we won't need any extra power cable to. Yeah, so you can see the, that platform up there. I did a bunch of these studies, the silhouettes, just to kind of see how different it is. So um, I think I'm missing the video on here, but as it turns, you can see the lines are ever changing. The negative space are also changing. It's never the same from any angle. And from this project, um, one of their customer is a, uh, is a dentist who just bought a practice and came to us and gave us the task of outfitting her whole office with artwork. So um, the building was done by Johnson Schmalling. And as you walk into the entry, we gave them two pieces in the entry. Um, behind you in space, there are some birch elements that uh, Johnson Schmalling had put in place. So we used that as an inspiration for this. Uh, positive piece we call it. that's that's the birch so we we took a bunch of birch and stack them up and then we made a casting of plaster on the right side and the way that we communicated that to to Mona was you know in dental practice you used to take impression with plaster so she really connected with that concept her two daughters <laughs> oh Caveat, these are all Johnson Smalling pictures. Just want to get that in there. <coughs> the really good looking ones. Um, that, uh, that gray um, felt piece behind Mona there uh, was probably the most labor intensive, I think, in terms of manual labor uh, piece that we did for her. It's a piece of felt that has um, overlapping rings and the overlapping rings represent places they've been or they've lived. And the size of the circles uh, speaks to like the value they place on the memories of each place. So they gave us a list and they kind of ranked the list and we, we sized the circles accordingly. So that's a close up of the, of the piece. So hand stitched by that individual there. <laughs> I believe I counted 12,000 stitches. 
Um, as you walk down the corridor, uh, past that exam room that we just saw with the felt piece, uh, sorry, that was the consult room. So these are the exam room. Um, on each uh, wall that, uh, that you enter, there's one of these pieces. And um, this piece has no particular connection to her practice or her personal life, but it was just a, um, an aesthetic thing that she was really drawn to when she gave us a few inspiration. She gave us a bunch of things that was on grid. So we kind of explored that a little bit. Um, each room has a different color, but um, what we were able to convince her was that um, subtlety is a lot better than um, loudness, let's say. Um, so uh, two layers of acrylic um, form on our own CNC machine carved and heat slumped and all that. But uh, you can see uh, the indirect light that uh, these pieces give off. These pieces give off. So she was. Um, I think her only criteria for the pieces in the exam room was that it has to be calming. She doesn't want to kind of agitate, you know, her uh, her patients when they're about to go under. So um, walking down the corridor further, there's a piece on your right there. Um, which is a ribbon piece. So we took a continuous piece of ribbon and ran it across. And it just, uh, if, you have a, if you have a chance to look at it uh, uh, up front, it's basically a landscape. Um, and then at the end of the corridor is a stainless piece aptly named Floss. Um, her idea. Floss was, an, uh, this piece was uh, an interesting exercise in um, material optimization too. If you were to draw the tightest rectangle boundary around here, that is exactly a five by 10 sheets of stainless. Um, we just wanted to maximize that for the most uh, length, uh, but we also wanted to keep it in one single cut so we can hang it, just bring it in, bring it on site and just hang it. So, um, Along with the material optimization, the script that I wrote, it, it, um, it, it was also looking for the most intersection point between the circles. Because you know, that uh, visually, I just uh, assumed would create the most interest. So. Um, I think these two pieces are the most dear to her. Um, they are fingerprints carving uh, of her kids. So we took a left, uh, the older, the, the older daughter left thumb and then the younger daughter right thumb uh, digitized that and um, made a custom layup of uh, foam boards, uh, white, gray, and black to give some depth and then CNC milled out their fingerprints. So, and just slightly above the ceiling there is one of the two custom fixtures that we made for her. Um, CNC Corian LED. That was a really long process uh, in engaging her with that too. Um, we drew some inspiration from her background and her grandparents. Um, I believe they were uh, textile dealers. So the, the main fixture that we made for her is this uh, piece we call Topi Cloud. Uh, Topi is a hat um, and we took form inspiration from that. Um, this sits in their main atrium. One of our latest projects we just completed in the third ward, um, Hoffman, York. They have a pretty highly visible um, uh, window. Uh, on what street is it? Water. Water. And so, this is uh, aluminum with um, custom dye mixture. Some much earlier work, um, I'm just going to run through this quickly. So uh, Jesuit Retreat House out of Oshkosh, um, we started this project in 2012, it didn't get complete until 2014. Um, 
the retreat house was adding a new uh, wing. Um, they have, uh, I think they added 20 beds for retreatants, but in the basement was a chapel. Um, we were tasked with designing the chapel and furnishing all the elements in it. So everything you see here with the, ex with the exception of the cross, the statue, and the cork flooring we did. From design to fabrication to install. Um, that uh, sanctuary lamp there was also a piece that we did. We had, a, uh, we had a form CNC out and then we sent it to a glass artist that slumped um, the piece over, uh, slumped her glass over the CNC form. This is a welcome piece of art in the main lobby. We also did a variety of other signage uh, thing for them too that uh, kind of ties the whole campus together. So this was a core tent with some stainless uh, from this work, um, we were working with a liturgical consultant that then brought us on to this project that we currently are working on. Um, St. Camillus is doing their, what, 120 million renovation project, or sorry, addition. So it's a huge project, but it's also have a uh, chapel in there that, again, we've been tasked with designing and furnishing everything inside. So this is an ongoing project for us. Um, I believe the only thing that we're not providing, again, is the carpeting, which is a custom carpet. And these are, um, what do you call those? Removable walls. But we will be pro providing the artwork on that, which are placeholders right now. So. Um, IHS Cross uh, Custom Glass. We're working with a glass artist in town to make those pieces. Um, the furniture, I think we are Furnishing, yeah. Um, tabernacle. So basically, all the pieces uh, we, we will furnish in here. So uh, this is the last project that I'm going to present, but um, I save it for last because there's a lot of process. Um, we were engaged by uh, Ergens in early 2014 um, to put a uh, HUM lobby sculpture um, in this space. They actually came to us after two rounds of seeking artist proposal. Um, the best one that was shared with us, have you seen that um, Simpson episode where Gary just go and he throws it? There was one of those solution, uh, proposal in there. So, <laughs> um, um, so we're, you know, uh, when they approached us, they were, they were sort of out of options, but it was a great opportunity for us. And uh, that's the raw space without the, uh, the sculpture. And this is one of the shots. Um, shortly after two weeks uh, marathon of installing. Um, please don't do that to us if we ever work together. Um, it's not their fault. The marble from Italy didn't come in on time. So not, not completely their fault. Some early sketching. Um, <coughs> We had, a, we had a variety of ideas from something really massive to uh, lightweight things, but uh, the, this is just two out of the many uh, sketches rolls that we had. Um, the best idea that came out of this was planking. So, uh, <laughs> suspending something heavy on a bunch of stilts. So, just through a series of refinement, um, we, uh, you know, um, in the discussion, they like the, what we did at Johnson Control, and we kind of want to bring that material studies back. So again, playing with that correct material, but this time this is glass and not plastic. Uh, we found a manufacturer. You might have, uh, you might have their samples. Benheim glass out of Germany. They have the dichroic film sandwiched in between two panes of glass. So uh, studying glass and uh, dichroic. Um, this idea was really interesting is to kind of take like uh, the street map and made three-dimensional tessellation out of them. So somewhere in there is the map of where the three neighborhoods met, Juno Village, I'm not going to say anymore. This is one of the scheme that had lighting as a component in it. and. Um, so this and 
the next scheme was really the start of the conversation. Um, they were really drawn to this. Um, surprisingly, internally, when we had our uh, group review, this was the least likely option. Uh, but then they, uh, but then client uh, Mark Ergens was, this was his choice from the beginning. So, so it's basically a bunch of nested uh, tensegrity structure, which I'll go into shortly here. Um, that's, this is called an X module. So there's two X's of equal size. And based on the tension cables, they stay together. So. Different arrangement studies to kind of distribute the light a little bit. Interestingly enough, if you notice, there was a doodle on the sketches that has a tensegrity structure. So uh, we came full circle with that, with that concept, which is always nice. Some earlier study models, um, again, um, this is uh, this shows two equal x's, and the problem with the two equal x's is that you can only create an isosceles triangle, but if you modify one of the x's to a different dimension, you can get an equilateral triangle. And now, why that's important is the is this uh, degree of symmetry that you have. So what this means is that we can only um, tessellate the next one as a mirror. With this it being a triangle, uh, a uh, equilateral triangle, we have three planes of symmetry, so we can mirror rotate in three different ways. So that gave us a lot of more tessellation, uh, tessellation options. Um, as you can see here, same face that was used, but depending on how you rotate it, right, you have three different arrangements. So same position, three different arrangements. So you might have figured out by now, I, I write a lot of code. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the code looking for space within that red volume. It's taking each of the module that we design and it's testing to see where it can place a module. Um, we affectionately call this a doseki. So, I don't remember how many iteration I, I've, uh, I ran through, but um, after each iteration, their position is recorded, but then I would inspect it visually too to see if we actually like the form or not, right? Because the computer doesn't always give us, I'm sorry, the code doesn't always give us a form that is aesthetically pleasing. It just give us a very sort of uh, numerical and technical solution. What did, um, you, what did you change? So um, what uh, the the main thing that I changed was the pos the starting position of the first one because that will dictate where the next one can go. Based on collisions with the next one. Yeah. And so um, sometimes I would take that initial one and start it all the way up here and let it walk down this way. So this is pretty close um, to the one that we ended up using in terms of form. So. The color is just their sequence in when they were uh, resolved and not have any collision. So, and the last view is always really slow because it's looking for a place to. It's looking for like new opportunities as one fail. Yeah. Yeah. So. Is that a custom script? Or like a yeah. yeah. Come on. Finish. <laughs> You get a few seconds left, but uh, yeah. So that last one is right there. So it it, it took a while. <laughs> That's my kid. Anything to stop Um. 
so that red volume was uh, actually a very architectural um, uh, constraint. We needed to stay X number of feet from the glass. That's what that red line, that big rectangle is. We needed to provide two zones of, uh, of lift for them to access the, the lights above. So that's, that was the starting point of uh, defining that um, zone for the sculpture to, uh, to exist. Um, and then we added uh, some more zone um, in the middle just for aesthetic reason uh, due to uh, those four earlier renderings of the different configuration. We know that we want to pinch the middle where that, uh, where that column is. So I just put some volumes in here to un just to kind of um, predetermine the form a little bit. This is a... Uh, a driver to make sure that the form goes on a diagonal line, right? And also that it will flare at the two ends. That's, that's why it's like that. So this is kind of like our own um, aesthetic that's controlling the script. So with the combination of the uh, direction and the uh, service zone, um, that was the red volume that you saw that defined where the module can tessellate. So now, you know, with the same script, if we were to put it in a different space with different requirement, we'll move those zones around, do a new definition for the form, and then we'll run the script, and we should have different variation. So, um, some structural analysis that, that we do in-house, uh, we have a software that helps us with kind of, just to kind of roughly understand if what we're um, proposing is, uh, is uh, constructible. So the blue represent the most deflection, the red means that it's stable. And that's the script. Um, this is defining, this is defining those, the doseki. Uh, this is some logic in tessellating. Um, and then this is the structural analysis end of it. There's Miguel sanding a copper tube. There was uh, how many tubes total? I'm starting to forget the, the specs on this. Three, 300 copper tubes, um, all custom laser cut with custom hardware that we CNC mill. Um, we also made the LED modules ourselves. First, uh, phys uh, first sort of like final lighting test in the space. For first full scale prototype, That's Lauren. So we built a jig just to help us set this, uh, set up the, uh, the dosekis. And here they are slowly coming off the assembly line. All the wires and internal wiring it's all inside the tubes. So all this, what did you manufacture on the site versus in your shop? Did you take that to the site? Yep. So these are module, uh, these sort of, we broke the entire thing into 15 sub cluster um, just to kind of make it manageable. some finished photos. The reflection at night is really beautiful on the, on the flooring and also in the glass as well too. That, that full scale prototype is a mini <laughs> fixture up there. And that's it. There's a lot, there's a lot more content, but.
It would probably take a whole day to. Yeah.